Well, welcome back. Uh, today, I would like to present the top 10 charts and websites I'm looking at today as far as understanding the state of the world, understanding where are the uh, better places to earn returns as an investor and where are some of the riskier places to earn returns as an investor. I'm gonna try to go quickly through these 10 charts. And as always, quick disclaimer, none of this is investment advice. This is for educational discussion purposes only. The first chart is the one that you see here in front of you. It is from the St. Louis Fed, site also known as FRED. This one shows you the difference between the rate that you earn lending money to the US government for 10 years fixed, minus the rate that you earn lending to the government for two years fixed. So in other words, if you could lend money to the US government for two years at 3%, and then for 10 years at 5%, this would be plus 2% like it was say in the early 1990s. Um, in general, we expect that if we're gonna fix a rate for 10 years, we would earn a higher rate of interest than if we only fix that rate for two years. So whenever we see this number go negative below zero, in other words, people are willing to accept the lower rate of interest for 10 years than for two years, we call this a yield curve inversion and usually it's a sign of a recession. So you'll notice every time this has gone uh, negative since the 1970s, we see one of these gray bars, which indicates a US recession. The last time this happened very, very briefly was in 2020. Now, again, people were debating at that time. No one thought that the yield curve inversion was predicting a global pandemic. But since then, we have seen the yield curve invert in here now in mid to late 2022, much deeper than it has really any time since the early 1980s. So right now you are receiving almost 0.4% less on a fixed 10 year loan to the US government than on a fixed two year loan to the US government. That is a sign that the Fed is probably choking off inflation, probably gonna force the US economy into recession and that the long-term rate of economic growth and inflation in the US is a lot lower than a lot of people think it might be. That brings us to the next chart here, which breaks down that 10 year rate of interest right now about 3.7% into two components. One is compensation for inflation. So in other words, if you're gonna lend money to the government for 10 years, you expect to be paid back for inflation, but you also expect a real rate of return on top of that. Well, for most of the past 10 years, the actual real rate of return that bond investors got in their money was close to zero, sometimes got as high as 1%. This was the last time I was really optimistic on bonds in 2018. But ever since COVID, you are actually paying 1% per year to the government to keep your money safe in, in real inflation adjusted terms. The reason the bond market has fallen this year is not because inflation expectations have increased. In fact, the expected rate of inflation, but according to the US bond market, has actually decreased from the start of this year till now. What has increased is that bond investors are demanding a higher real rate of return above inflation in order to hold bonds, in order to lend money to everyone. That is unsustainable for an economy with the rate of real growth that the US has. So that again is why I think this is, might be pulling the US economy into recession and why I think interest rates are likely flattening out, bottoming out, and we need to prepare for the next economic cycle. Why do I think this is a longer term trend we need to watch? We need to look at population structures. This next chart is from the World Bank and it shows the percentage of the world population age 15 to 64. This is basically the working age population. Now you'll notice this is not just the US population, this is the population of the entire world. And you'll notice that really since about 2014, the percentage of the world population in this range that is working age is actually started declining, not just in the US, but globally. And you can guess that that's not being made up by the percentage that's uh, 15 and under. If we break this down by country, we see a picture that's a little bit more nuanced. So here we see the US picture is actually somewhat stable. I mean, the US working age population was growing in the 60s and 70s, but it's actually been on decline for a while now. It was roughly even from the 80s to the early 2000s, and it's been declining over the past 10 years. That's gonna be a little incompatible with one of the other charts I'm gonna show you later. But the bigger one are the two countries that have over a billion in population, China and India. China, of course, saw its fabulous growth recently because its working age population was growing and going from poor to lower middle class, you might say. Um, China's working age population, po working age population though, has been declining. Meanwhile, India's is continuing to rise, which is why many people are looking at countries in India and Southeast Asia as the next place to look for growth as we looked for China before. The country that I always think is ahead of the curve is Japan because Japan's working age population has been declining for 30 years now. 
as has its stock market and real estate market. So a lot that we can unpack there, but I wanna show this chart highlighting how important this is to you. The part of the, the chart that I think does need to be looked at is the, the segment 65 and over, because that is the fastest growing segment of the population, not just in the US, not just in Japan, but really globally. The big question for China is, will it get old before it gets rich? I mean, depending on how you measure it now, that is the you know, $10 trillion question to watch for investors over the next few years. Moving on to stocks, this next chart is the main one that I look at when deciding, um, is it better to allocate more to the US stock market, to European stocks, to Asian stocks, and so forth. Um, I check this about once a month, and this one was recently updated. We can see here, and we just ha now have the data for 30th of September, 2022, the most uh, recent update. This was updated just today. I was checking yesterday. You'll notice right now the US trades at what's, what is called a CAPE ratio of 26.45. This is basically the average inflation adjusted earnings of US companies over the past 10 years. You take the current price of US stocks divided by that, it's 26.45. Whereas in Europe, that number is 17. And if you look at another number, say Singapore, you'll notice it's uh, much lower, it's around 13. So what does that mean? General rule of thumb, not guaranteed, but if you wanna estimate what the rate of return is on a stock market over the next say 10, 20 years, you take one divided this number, which would Im imply that for the US, forward looking rates of return are probably closer to 4% a year, not terribly exciting. In Europe, they're a little bit higher, maybe around 5%, but they are still higher in Asia, especially the parts of Asia that are less well valued. I'll provide the link to this. You can click on all of these different markets and decide which ones you think are cheap or expensive. Another chart this year that I thought was worth sharing was this one that I found in Twitter. And um, I always feel the need to double check these, but this one at least has a fairly clean pattern here. It shows the uh, relationship between price to revenue ratio, price to sales, so a different ratio at the start of a decade versus the subsequent 10 year rate of return on the S&P 500. And what it basically shows is that the more expensive the S&P 500 is when you start, the lower your rate of return over the next 10 years, and the lower this ratio is when you start, the higher the return is over the next 10 years. Not rocket science, but what this particular uh, tweeter was pointing out was that on the day that he tweeted this, that ratio for the S&P 500 was 2.28, which has historically corresponded with a 0% rate of return over the next 10 years. In other words, implying a possible lost decade for US stocks over the next 10 years. Um, something to consider as well in terms of, do you wanna to allocate to the US versus other markets? Um, we can double check this number if we look on say, the Morningstar page for the S&P 500, it is showing a price to sales ratio of only 1.87. So a little bit lower, implying a slightly higher rate of return, still not fantastic. Uh, you can also look at something like the price to earnings ratio, which is only 15.12 for the S&P 500 right now. These overall might not seem so bad, but when I'm looking at US stocks, I'm not looking at the S&P 500. I'm looking at the cheaper, smaller, higher yielding, higher, more profitable companies in the US. That, for example, is what we find in, say, the dimensional US small cap value fund. So just to compare here, when we look at the price to sales ratio, it's not 1.8, it's 0 0.5. When we look at the PE, it's not 15, it's seven and a half. Um, and if we look at emerging markets, it gets even more dramatic. Um, now, these are leading companies in co markets like China, India, South Korea, uh, Philippines, South Africa, these are markets that still have better demographics and more growth uh, ahead of them. And this particular fund is currently trading at a PE ratio of around six. So do some quick math. That generally means higher expected returns and less, gro less growth absolutely collapses in these. You can scroll down to find a little more about what the actual country and industry exposure of a fund like this is. But I just wanted to close this off. That right now is 10 websites, 10 charts, 10 data points I'm looking at in making investment decisions today. Thank you for joining me and hope to do more of these next time. As always, please leave a comment uh, below if you would like to see more videos like this. Thank you very much.